It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. Our phone lines are open. If you have a Bible-related question, give us a call now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, listening friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? A young boy in Ontario, Canada, Riel Guinean, was camping with his parents and he decided to stay on land while they rowed out into the lake for a little fishing. Tragically, their boat tipped over in the water far from shore and the boy watched as his parents drowned. Sobbing, he tried walking towards a town several miles away, but as darkness fell, he knew that he'd have to spend the night on the cold, damp ground. As the temperatures had dipped below freezing during the night, he lay there shivering and crying. He felt a warm, furry body snuggle up to his back in the dark. Delirious from his ordeal and thinking the creature must be a dog, he fell asleep. When he stiffly woke in the morning, he discovered that these three beavers had curled up around him and kept him from freezing to death. As he sat up, they calmly waddled away. You know, Pastor Ross, that makes me think about uh, a number of stories in the Bible, if you come to mind, how God has used animals to uh, keep people safe. That's right, Pastor Doug. We were just talking about this before we went on the air. There's a number of Bible examples. For example, you have the donkey in the case of Balaam that actually, or Balak, that, um, yeah, Balaam's donkey that mm -hmm. actually protected him from an angel with yeah. the sword. And you have the whale that swallowed Jonah. And, you know, we did an amazing and fact. And of course, not, didn't just swallow him. He put him back on dry land. Yeah, yeah. three-day journey. And then we did an amazing fact, I, th I thought of as well, of a, uh, I think it was a woman that fell overboard as she was swimming. She was surrounded by sharks. And uh, some dolphins came. That's right. And they actually uh, scared away the sharks or butted away the sharks. And then they protected her. And, uh, and uh, she could be rescued. Yeah, and they buoyed yeah. her up when she was sinking. You think in the Bible about... Um, Elijah, how he was sustained by the, the ravens. And I guess you could make an argument that Isaac was going to be sacrificed, but they found a ram That's right. to, to take his place. But, you know, it, it just reminds us that, um, you know, God created these animals. Um, in many ways, sometimes animals seem to be more in tune with the leading of the spirit and God than humans do. There's an interesting passage in the book of Job. I've been reading through Job lately, and it's just a, f a fantastic book. And it says in Job 12, verse 7, But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? You can see the fingerprints of the Lord on all of creation, and we can even learn something about God and his love uh, through the creatures that he's made. You know, we do have a book that talks about uh, the wonders of creation, mm -hmm. and this is a free gift. We don't always offer, the, offer this book, Pastor Dove, but, but it is a great book, and we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. The number for the book is 800-835-6747, and you can ask for the book. It's called Amazing Wonders of Creation. We'll get that in the mail. We'll send it to anyone in mm -hmm. North America. If you're outside of North America, you can just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.org, and you click on the free library, and you'll be able to read the book right there online. And also, we were just informed before the program, this, this is our one-year anniversary for doing Bible Answers Live on television. Of course, it started as a radio program. How many years ago, Pastor Doug? Uh, it must be 27 years ago, 25 years ago, I forget. It's been a long time. A long time, yeah. <laughs> and then we expanded from land-based uh, radio stations to satellite radio, and then social media, and then Amazing Facts TV. Yeah. And I think we're even looking to expand on some other networks in this next coming year. So exciting things with Bible Answers Live. Yes, and it's a joy. We always like hearing people that say they watched the program, it answered some lifelong question that really helped them. 
That's right. Well, we've got questions lined up. If you have a question, friend, the number to call is 800-463-7297. That is our phone line here to the studio, 800-463-7297. That's a good time to um, pick up your phone, give us a call. Uh, but before we go to the phone lines, we start. We always like to start with a word of mm -hmm. prayer. So let's do that. Dear Father in heaven, give me thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for life and strength and the ability to study your word. Thank you for the freedom that you have given us here in this country. Mm -hmm. And so we ask your blessing upon the program. Be with us as we search the scriptures and be with those who are listening wherever they might be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're ready to go to our first caller this evening. We've got Anthony listening in Michigan. Uh, Anthony, welcome to the program. Hello, sir. Hello, Pastor Doug. Hi, Anthony. Thank you for calling. Get me on here. Um, great to be here again. So, my question, I'm going to be a try to be as quick with my wording as I can about this. Um, my sister... years ago and I mean I don't think she had as many reasons as somebody say Joe but I don't think she was like too far from getting there at mm -hmm. the same time um and as far as I know she, I've never once heard her she didn't like see God as her savior I never once even saw her actually like give up just out of frustration which i've done myself mm -hmm. um and all this time i actually thought she had a way stronger will than me and and I, and what's ironic is when she died at the, the age that she did a few years before that i picked a random number that i'd be okay with dying at, and it was that one mm. and then i just felt bad for saying i'd be okay with dying at this age mm -hmm. so and so you, but, your your sister took her life. Yeah, I mean there was a there was a bunch of times where my dad held her accountable for things that weren't her fault. Like he made her work off an ambulance bill for the first time she had an asthma attack. Mm. Well, not right, the so greatest. Uh, yeah, God knows the circumstances. So is your concern? You're wondering what does the Bible say, and does this mean? Well, she is there hope of salvation, or does this mean she's destined to be lost? Is that what you're kind of wondering? Um. I'm kind of hoping that there's some chance that she won't be in the Great Lake of Fire, but that I will see her. All right, that's well. That that's a tough, tough experience. And you know, as pastors, Pastor Ross and I have dealt with families that have um, experienced suicide, and yes, it even happens in Christian families. Um, the first thing I would say is just keep in mind that God loves our friends and family, loved ones, infinitely more than we do, infinitely more. He's desperate to save as many as he can. God is not willing that any should perish. Now, obviously, some will be saved and some will not. And you just really can't spend time in this life wondering. Now, there will be examples, I'm sure, in heaven of people that took their own lives. We don't know the circumstances. They had, um, you know, they encountered some struggles. They had uh, faith in God, but something happened it could have been physical pain or chemical imbalance and you know god will have to judge these things so i would never say that that's a hopeless situation it's usually very concerning because often when a person takes their life it means they've lost faith they've lost hope and those are usually not a good barometer of a person's spiritual life but i would just say put this in the hands of the lord and do not worry uh, when jesus comes the bible says he will wipe away all tears from our eyes and I think we're going to be very surprised when we get to heaven. We're going to see people there we never dreamed would be there. And we'll see some people missing we might thought would be there. So don't worry about it now. Trust God's goodness and his justice. And um, he's got plans for your life. So you live to the fullest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, we, our heart go, goes out to you, Anthony. As Pastor Doug mentions, we work with families from time to time who have gone through this loss. And you know, you can't turn, the Bible says we can cast all of our cares upon the Lord, for mm -hmm. he cares for us. And uh, yeah, some of these are difficult th experiences, but God knows and understands that we can trust in him. Yep. Yeah. 
Well, thank you for By your the call. way, and I do have an article you'll find on the Amazing Facts website. You just type in, uh, you know, Doug Batchelor answers on suicide, and I give more scriptures, and I go to greater length in explaining that. And you can look that up, Anthony, and we'll keep you in prayer. That's a tough experience. Our next caller that we have is Randy, listening in uh, Ohio. Randy, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Pastor Ross, Pastor Doug. Um, my question is, could you please explain Daniel? In particular, where it talks about the God of forces and the God whom his fathers knew not. My main part is, could this God of forces possibly refer to the U.S.? Okay, thank you. And uh, your phone cut off for a second. You're asking us to explain Daniel 11:38, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. All right. This is. A um, first, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to spell this out for some of our oh, listeners. Oh, I just said. <clears throat> Excuse me, in particular, where it talks about the God of forces and right. the God whom his fathers knew not, yes. if this could be the USA. All right. My initial answer will be, no, I don't believe this is speaking of the USA. I believe in Daniel 11, it's talking about uh, a power that's also presented in Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation 13. It's this uh, beast power that is the commingling of religion and uh, Christianity and uh, spiritualism and government. And what uh, most Protestant theologians identify that with the papacy. Uh, I know Martin Luther and John Wesley, founders of the Methodists, Calvin, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, uh, Charles Spurgeon. This is what they all believe when they read those prophecies. What it's saying here in Daniel 11:38. Uh, it says he will not regard the God of his fathers or the desire of women. And some have interpreted that to mean, you know, the um, priests do not marry. Uh, and then it says, but in his estate, he'll honor the God of forces. And that word forces or fortresses, it comes from the Hebrew word mahuzim, which means basically uh, a God. It's the gods of saints, the departed. And what you see happening in Catholicism is they surround themselves with images and saints and they pray to these saints and they deify the dead and they make kind of mini gods out of them and that's the way i think many of the reformers understood this passage so no i don't think it's talking about the united states although the bible does talk about the u.s yeah there's prophecy. another prophecy on that that's right the second beast of revelation 13. we do have a study guide that talks about the united states in prophecy and you might find this interesting randy or anyone willing to learn more about it you can just call and ask. The study mm -hmm. guide's called the USA in Bible Prophecy. And the number for that is 800-835-6747. And we'll be happy to send that to anyone in North America. That's 800-835-6747. We've got Ken listening from New York. Ken, you're on Bible Answers Live. Good evening, gentlemen. Evening. Thanks for calling. Thank you for having me. My question is about taken from... Romans chapter 16 and 1. Uh, in that passage, Phoebe is referred to as a deacon or a deaconess, I guess. Uh -huh. And I was just trying to reconcile that because I've always heard that the uh, deacon must be the husband of one wife. I wonder if you could shed some light on that for me. Yeah, well, the word deacon is, is used in a general sense. You know, you find the word servant all through the uh, New Testament. And so when for our friends that are listening, the verse that we're considering is Romans 16. One. Let me read it quickly. Paul says, I commend to you, Phoebe. <laughs> we once had a pet poodle named Phoebe. My mom liked the name. Sorry. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant in the church of Crenshaw, that uh, you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints and a sister in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper. And there you've got the the uh, definition of servant. She's been a helper of many and myself also. So there is this dear sister in the church and she's traveling for some reason for, from one church to another. Evidently she's going to uh, um, uh, from Crenshaw maybe to Rome and uh, Paul is saying, you know, treat her well. Uh, she's got our endorsement. She's been a servant. Now keep in mind, Paul even says that the widows who are to receive sustenance from the church must be genuine widows. They must be willing to be of service in the church. He even says to, if they've washed the apostles' feet or disciples' feet. So the word service here doesn't necessarily mean a church office. It means to be a servant. Yeah. And the, the original word there in the Greek is also used, uh, can be translated as deacon 
or deaconess. However, in this verse, it's interesting, it's in the feminine form. So more accurate, if you want to translate it into English, it would be a deaconess, mm -hmm. which is a little different than the criteria that we find given for a deacon, which is in right. the masculine sense. So mm -hmm. we recognize in our church, we have different positions, different responsibilities. We have deacons, we have deaconesses, and deaconesses do serve a very important role in the church, especially in the area of ministering to the needs of some of the, the folks in the church. They're involved in the communion, the preparation mm -hmm. for communion, the visitation of the sick, working with the children. So there's, there's many important roles that are fulfilled by the deaconesses. Right. And apparently in the early Christian church, we find this structure was already in place. And Phoebe was very much involved, maybe as a leader amongst the deaconesses in that capacity. Right. Which is a, a different definition than when Paul says the deacon must be a husband of one wife. Right. Different responsibilities. Yeah. And that was the masculine. So I hope that helps, Ken. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. I appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate your call. Next caller that we have is Ian listening in Canada. Ian, welcome to the program. You're on the air. Thank you so much, Pastor Ross and Pastor Doug. And I just want to thank you really quick because your programs are a huge blessing in my life, and I love watching them. Oh, thank you. And listening to them. My question is, uh, is this. In watching one of your programs, I thought I heard uh, you, Pastor Doug, mention something about in the last times that uh, many would be called up in the spirit of Elijah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to clarify if, uh, if I heard that correctly and if there's um, maybe some Bible verses that support that or just generally um, where that uh, what it came from, if I did hear that correctly. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, you find in the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, some of the last verses, Jesus said, first he says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I gave him in Mount Horeb for all Israel with its statutes and judgments. And behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So we know that John, that, uh, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but that was not before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, he said, Elijah has come. Speaking of John, he said, Elijah will come. So in the same way that John the Baptist came, to prepare the children of Israel for the first coming of Jesus, uh, Jesus seemed to imply that that same spirit of John the Baptist, one calling people to revival, that will say, prepare the way of the Lord, make way uh, for the Lord in the wilderness, um, will come again before the second coming of Jesus. And so that's an example of two of those verses. I think one is in Matthew 11, and the other I just read is Malachi chapter 4. So, uh, and of course, the angel said to Zechariah that John the Baptist would go in the spirit and power of Elijah. Um, and that's in the Gospel of Luke, um, first chapter, I believe. So, awesome. you, does that make sense or help a little? Yeah, yeah, that absolutely. I try, after I heard it on the program, I tried to do some digging on my own and failed. So, you, you gave me a great shortcut just now. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, let's all pray we can have that spirit. <laughs> That's the plan. God yeah. bless you both. God bless. Next caller that we have is uh, Byron listening from Canada. Byron, welcome to the program. Hello, Pastor Rose and Pastor Doug. Bless your ministry. I really enjoy watching you guys and everything that you do. Thank you. My question is, uh, what is on Daniel 12, verse 12? And he's talking about blessed are those who wait to come for the 1,335 days. What is the 1,335 days represent? All right, to understand that, I'm gonna ask Pastor Ross to answer it, but let me just set it up. To understand that there are three time periods given in Daniel chapter 12. And so before you can cut off the 1335, you've got to know about the 1260 and the 1290. So this is a complicated prophecy. It's real hard to you know, we try to budget about three minutes for an answer. It's kind of hard to fit this all into a three-minute answer. Right. Uh, you got the 1260-year time period, which is a very significant time period. That represents the reign of the papal power during the Dark Ages from 538 until 1798. So that's 1260 years. Then you have the 1290 years, which is uh, when Clovis, uh, king of the Franks, was converted to Christianity. And that opened up the way for papal power in 605. No, 508. Uh, 508, sorry, the other one. 508 um, kind of opened up the way for papal supremacy in Europe. And then the 1335, if you start with that same date, 508, and you go forward in time, 
you end on the date 1843. Now, you might be wondering what happened in 1843. Well, there was a great revival, especially in the prophecies of Daniel, that occurred around 1843, 1844. And so the verse says, Blessed is he who waits till that time period. There was a special manifestation of the Spirit. Uh, there was a revival not only in North America, but it spread to Europe and even as far away as South American missionary outposts around the world. There was a great interest in the prophecies of Daniel in particular. And so this verse is a reference to that revival that occurred around 1843. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting time prophecy, and it parallels or ties in with Revelation chapter 10, which also talks about that same experience around 1844. So I know that's a lot to take in, but uh, you know we need to get something in writing on that, Pastor Ross. And hope that helps a little, Byron. You know, we do have a study guide that calls that's called Right on Time. And I don't think it gets into the specifics here of the 1335 and the 1290, but the it does 1260. talk about the 1260 yeah. and give you the historical evidence for the start of that time period. So that might be of interest. And we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. It's, uh, number is 1-800-835-6747. Uh, you can ask for the study guide. It's called Right on Time. Yeah. Next caller that we have is Joel listening in North Carolina. Joel, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor Doug, Pastor Ross. Hi. And your question. Uh, my question is about Ezekiel chapter 1, 26 through 28. Is this talking about God the Father or God the Son? All right, let me read this for our listeners. We always try to be mindful that a lot of the folks listening are driving, and they can't just stop and look it up. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. And on the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearances of his waist upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber, with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around it, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was this the appearance of brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Well, I think most people reading this, or scholars anyway, they, they see a, a similarity between this passage and what you find in Revelation 1, where Jesus appears to John. And so we believe this would be a God, the Son, in his glory. And keep in mind, the Bible says no man has seen the Father. So if Ezekiel saw this vision, he's probably seeing God the Son. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting, you got a parallel with Revelation chapter 4, where it describes the heavenly throne room and some of the yep. similarities. It's a sea. Here it's talking about the blue, the, mm -hmm. the color of the stone. It's talking about a rainbow surrounding the throne. A lot of parallels between Revelation 4 and what we see over here in Ezekiel. That's right. All right, thank you for your call. Our next caller that we have is John listening in Washington. John, welcome to the program. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, my question is uh, regarding use of a, a phrase in in, in uh, funerals mm -hmm. of uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and if that comes from a scripture, I'd like to know what it is, and also in any scripture that would pertain to uh, cremation. Okay, the the scripture and the word ashes and dust is synonymous in I think in Hebrew. And when God said to Adam, and I believe, Pastor Ross, it's Genesis 3, he said, dust you are, and unto dust you will return. And then when you, you're inquiring about uh, cremation, what does the Bible say about this? We, it's a good question, because something everyone deals with at some point. And uh, I'll give you a little shameless plug here, is I did a video on that, because we received that question too much, and it's called To Bury or To Burn. If you go to YouTube, you can see it for free. And I take a lot of scripture. I take more time there than I, I would have here. Uh, but in a quick answer, I would say, uh, predominantly in the Bible, the example you see is for burial. Um, I don't think this is a salvation issue where if a person is cremated instead of buried, they can't be saved because many Christians were burnt at the stake. There are two examples of people we know that were uh, cremated in the Bible that um, you've got Jonathan, who is the son of, of King Saul, dear friend of David, and uh, he was cremated, and we fully expect to see him in the resurrection. Uh, his was not a martyr's death. He wasn't cremated by the enemy, but uh, his own people, when his, his body had been mutilated in a battle, they took his remains and cremated him. Um, 
And of course, well, his father, King Saul, but he's not going to make it as far as we can tell. Anyway, but um, I thought there was one other example. So, um, yeah, typically in the Bible, I can understand the practicality of it. I think in Tokyo right now, virtually everybody's cremated because they just don't have space for graveyards. And in America now, all the, the graveyard space is being taken up by golf courses, so they have very little space left <laughs> for, for graveyards in North America. So more people are turning to cremation. And I think uh, somebody it's certainly said cheaper. It is cheaper. Uh, cremation is <coughs> almost speeding up the process of burial. I mean, if somebody's buried long enough, uh, maybe all that's left is bones, you might say, but um, cremation speeds up the Accelerates process. the yeah. uh, decomposition process. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for your call. The next caller that we have is, um, we've got Benita listening in North Carolina. Benita, welcome to the program. Benita, you there? She might be on mute. Benita, you're on the air. Benita, All right, we might need once. to come back to Benita. Yeah. There you are. Hello. Benita, we think, are you there? All right, we might come back. You know, Pastor Doug, I'm looking at the clock. I don't know. Do we have time to take another call? Let's try a quick one. All right, we've got Scott listening in Florida. Scott, we've got about a min minute and a half before the break. Hi, how are you? Good. How can we help you today? Pastor Bachelor, you'll be in my neighborhood this week coming up. But um, my, my question is not a good one-minute question, but uh, it was about the two witnesses, and I've been studying really hard on it. And uh -huh. I've come up the... Um, two that I think they are, and I have pretty good feelings about it, you know, praying with the Holy Spirit, is it's the Jews and the Gentiles that represent the two witnesses. What do you think? All right, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I would say that uh, when I read it, these two witnesses that um, are by the throne of God is a parallel for what you find in Zechariah. It talks about the two witnesses by the throne, the candlesticks, Typically, they're understood to be the law and the prophets or the word of God. And that is a witness. They, you know, Jesus said in the mouth of two witnesses, Christ rose from the dead and says, speaking from the law and the prophets, he taught them that he was the Messiah. You might say Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus on the mountain. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And I think Pastor Ross, we even have a book on this that we could send to um, uh, Scott and uh for free he can actually read it online talks about uh, the glorious mount who are the two witnesses the number to call for that is 800-835-6747 you can just simply call and ask for the book on the two witnesses called the glorious mount we'll be happy to send it to anyone in north america yeah sorry to cut that question short scott take a look at the book and let us know if that helps a little bit and you keep studying listening friends we're not done we're just taking a brief break we're going to come back with more questions Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. Millions of people believe that planet Earth is on the verge of some apocalypse that will plunge the world's cities into chaos. In response, thinking people everywhere are wondering if it might be a good time to locate their families outside of the congested metropolitan areas. In my new book, Heading for the Hills, A Beginner's Guide to Country Living, I do my best to provide a biblical balance. I'd like to share with you some of the crucial things you'll need to know before you head up for the hills. I'd also like to identify some of the practical things you look for in buying a piece of country land, how to develop water, power, and a garden, all while still seeking to save the lost. This book has some very valuable information for anybody that's ever considering country living. Order your copy of Heading for the Hills, call 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was violent, 
They were ruthless. They were determined. This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history. Kingdoms in time. Are you ready? You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. And some have tuned in along the way. This is a live, international, interactive Bible study. You interact by calling in with your Bible questions. The number is 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 463-7297. And I am Doug Batchelor. My name is Jean Ross, and we have a number of folks who have called in, and they're ready with their Bible questions. So we'll go to Benita, uh, and uh, Benita listening in North Carolina. Benita, you there? I am. Hi, you on the air. Thank you. Ever since I was probably four, I came to understand that God can read our minds and knows what our thoughts are, but the devil cannot. And so I've always had a much better comfortability with praying through thought rather than verbally, unless it's in a public setting. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there's examples in the Bible. I know in the book of Nehemiah, it tells us that uh, Nehemiah, obviously, he prayed in his heart. He was about to answer the king, and he wasn't sure what to say, and he's standing there, so he prays in his heart. Um, God tells us he knows what things we have need of before we even ask. And the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 8, I think it's verse 39, that God and God only knows the thoughts of men's hearts. So the devil can't read our minds. Only God can do that. A people can guess what someone else is thinking, and the devil is probably very good at that, looking at body language. But only God really knows the heart. But there's nothing wrong with praying out loud. I think there's power sometimes in praying out loud. We have some wonderful prayers in the Bible that are recorded from Jesus and Daniel and Mary and Abraham and others because they prayed out loud, they're recorded. So, uh, you know, when you pray out loud, I think angels surround you. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, not my will, thy will be done. And then you've got that beautiful prayer in John 17 that's recorded because obviously the Lord prayed out loud. So don't be afraid to do that i think the devil trembles when you pray out loud but there's certainly nothing wrong with praying in your heart i probably do most of my praying that way because mm-hmm. you walk and talk to the lord when you're praying in your heart we got a book it's called teach us to pray yeah. and it lays out some of these biblical principles that uh, talk about prayer we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks the number is 800-835-6747 and again just ask for the book it's called teach us to pray and mm-hmm. we'll send it to anyone in north america Thank you for your call, Vanina. We've got Rich listening in Michigan. Rich, welcome to the program. Rich in Michigan, you are you there? You might be muted, Rich. Rich, one more time. All right, while we wait there, let's go to uh, Yolanda in Arizona. Yolanda, welcome to the program. Hello. Hi, thanks for calling. Hi, Hi thank you for taking my call. Um, My family and I have been studying the last day events, Mm -hmm. and so I have a question. In the last day events, when Satan appears as the false Christ, will that be before or after the close of probation? Ah, good question. Well, first of all, once probation closes, the saved are saved and the lost are lost, right? We understand that? Right. Uh, I can't understand why the devil would save his masterpiece of deception for a time when it was too late to make any difference. So I think it's immediately prior to the close of probation that he pulls out his best game plan and tries to impersonate Christ. Um, So, you know, that's why Jesus warns his disciples, there will be false Christs and false prophets. If, uh, If their salvation is all secure before they come, then 
they wouldn't really need to worry about that. But he tells okay, them, so of course, there have been false Christ through history, for that matter. But, yeah, the, I'm talking about the ultimate deception of Satan where he impersonates Christ, I think, is uh, just before the close of probation when he's hoping to accomplish the most damage. Yeah, but you would think that, because okay, I can see it go both ways. So when it's, um, so you're saying it's after or before? I'm thinking that, and you know, I could be wrong on this, but my understanding is that Satan is going to reserve that masterpiece of deception for a time when it's going to still have an impact. And uh, that's why Jesus warns, do not go forth if someone says, here is Christ or there. So the church is being warned against that deception. If all the saved are saved and the lost are lost and probation is closed, then there's really no risk of anybody being deceived by that. Okay, so, so you're saying before. Yeah, I think shortly before. Because you would think if it's after, that he would still try one more time, because it says that no one will know the hour, the day or the hour, or, well, when he comes, but also, too, he doesn't know when the close of, and I'm talking about Satan, he doesn't know the day of, or, when, or, or the, the moment when, when probation closes. So you would think at the end, um, after probation closes, that he would try and attempt the, the God's people. Well, you see, once probation, try... once probation closes, I'm actually doing a study on this tomorrow morning. Uh, once probation closes, you've got the Great Tribulation, the seven last plagues are falling. Right. And I think people are going to be so distracted by the plagues. You know, they're going to just be cursing God. So uh, now Jesus says that uh, the deception in the last days will be so effective that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. So God preserves the elect from being deceived. But uh, I think the door is probably still open. That's why the Lord is warning about that. But anyway, again, I'm speculating a little bit because there's no, as far as I know, there's no, what do you call it, uh, decisive comment on that in the Bible. You mm -hmm. just kind of have to do some detective work and make your make an educated right. guess. Right. Okay. So I, I, I thought I heard you mention that you're doing this tomorrow. Well, you, you yeah, I we're recording tomorrow. It'll actually be on YouTube. So I'm doing a three-part okay. series on the kind of the three phases of the tribulation, the Great Tribulation that are spoken oh, okay, of in, in uh, uh, what do you call it, Matthew 24. So yeah, watch okay. for that. It'll be on the YouTube Doug Batchelor Amazing Facts channel. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so All much. All right, thank you. All right, next caller that we have is, uh, we'll try Rich again in Michigan. Rich, um, welcome to the can, program. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're can you good. Can you hear me now? You're on. All right, <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, I've been listening to you guys for a while now. But um, the other day, something struck me. I was listening to, I don't know if it was you guys or somebody else, but they said that when we die, we're sleeping. And, you know, if, if we die in Christ, we're sleeping in Christ, and we don't know the time or anything until he comes back the second time to collect us, you right. know. But then in the Bible, it, you know, it says that the rich man at, and uh, Lazarus, they were at, he was at the gate begging, and they both died, and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, but the rich man went to hell or whatever. He Just said, let me take, yeah. Hades, let me take a drip of water, let him put, put a drip of water on my finger, and God says, no, the thing is too wide. You had your chance and blew it. Right. Now, that, that says right there that we didn't just go to hell and wait, I mean, in, in our grave and waiting for him to come. We're... Uh, Alive and going somewhere else. Or All right, let's talk about you see, that. I'm kind of confused on that one. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, so when we're talking about the rich man and Lazarus, this is a passage you find in Luke chapter, I think it's 16, verse 19. Mm -hmm. And it's a parable. And you've got parables around it. And one reason we know it's a parable is there's nowhere else in the Bible that says all of those that die go to Abraham's bosom. So here's what right. Jesus is teaching in that parable. He's warning the Jewish nation that was rich in truth and feasting on the word of God. They were not loving or caring about the Gentiles begging for the crumbs that fell from their table. The Gentiles, their place of punishment was called Hades. The Jews, their place of reward was to be with Abraham. And so what Jesus does is he tells this parable and he switches places. He's got the rich man going to the Gentile place of torment and he's got the poor Gentile beggar, Lazarus. He's going to the rich man's, to the Jewish place of reward. And Christ is saying right. 
that uh, if you do not believe Moses and the prophets, you wouldn't be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. Of course, Jesus did rise from the dead. The religious yes. leaders did not believe. He even rose someone from the dead by the name of Lazarus, and they did not believe. So this is a parable. It's not talking about the state of man and death because think about yes. it. Will the people in heaven be able to talk to the people burning in hell? No, I Let's don't think so. Well, no, so you can't take that literally. Hand, well, well, would one drop of water really cool them? No, well, it's a metaphor. not at all. Yeah, so the, what about it's full the, of metaphors. The guy on the cross that says, you'll be, in heaven with me, you'll be in paradise with me today. Yeah, actually, if you look at that, uh, you know, there's no punctuation in the original. What Jesus said is, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Christ could not have been with the thief in paradise that day because you read in John chapter 20, when Christ rises from the dead, he tells Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me, do not touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. So Christ right. is telling Mary Sunday morning, he still hasn't ascended to the father. How could he be with the thief in paradise Friday afternoon? Right, that's why I'm having trouble. You know, so you well, you we've, know, you've got a lesson on that. You really do. appreciate it. Yeah. You know, the thief, talking about the thief, he wasn't expecting to go to paradise that day because he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Mm -hmm. So he was looking forward to the second coming of Christ and saying, Lord, remember me. And so Christ assured him oh. that day that he would be in the future with him in paradise. And that's the assurance that well, we can have right away when we receive Jesus. So we, we do go to sleep then and we're not. I mean, we're just asleep there until he does come. We don't know the time passes yeah, or but anything. Yeah, but for a believer, a believer, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you're saved and you die, your next conscious thought is the resurrection. So there's no consciousness of time for you. Right. Um, oh, actually, because we're, we're asleep anyway. We're you're, asleep we're unconscious. It's, it's a totally dreamless sleep. You know, it's not like you sleep uh, where you, you know, roll over during the night. You have no right. awareness of time. One, let me give you more proof of that. King David died 3,000 years ago. The Bible says David okay. slept with his fathers. Acts chapter 2, 1,000 years later, Peter says, David is dead and buried and not ascended to heaven. His tomb is with us to this day. He couldn't be any more clear. He's dead. He's in the grave. He's not yet ascended to heaven. This is after the right. resurrection. So, th but for David who died, his next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord. The resurrection. Jesus the time. Yeah, okay. you look in First Thessalonians chapter four, it says the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Then the dead in Christ will rise first. So when does that happen? When the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. You know, Rich, we got a uh, study guide that if you haven't seen, it's just packed with scripture. It's a great study. It's called "How the Dead Really Dead," and we'll be happy to send this to you or anyone who calls and asks. The number is eight hundred eight three five six seven four seven. Just call and ask, are the dead really dead? We'll send it to you again. It's 800-835-6747. And if you want to learn more about it, you can just go to the Amazing Facts website as well. And we have a number of articles. Actually, Pastor Doug, we got a, a website that Amazing Facts uh, has sponsored called deathtruth.com. That's right. And it's got a lot of scriptures there. And I think that study is even people available online for people to that. read. So take a look at deathtruth.com. There's actually some videos, some sermons there, and I think you'll be blessed by that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your call, Rich. We've got Hector listening in Florida. Hector, welcome to the program. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, yes. I would love to know um, something about uh, Revelation 12, verse 9 to 13. Um, my concern about this is um, how 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 the the title of lucifer has been changed from lucifer to satan or devil or or, or, or ancient serpent where he didn't even reach to the earth as yet to to persecute the people was on earth and uh, and, and also the second question that i have and that and that uh, reference um how could uh, it get cast out directly to the earth all right Let's talk about that. And the question is here in Revelation chapter 12, I think you said verses 9 uh, through oh, at least 11. And it says, So that great dragon was cast out, uh, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So right there is a very interesting passage because it identifies the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. Uh, that's all talking about the same person. And then you also mentioned 
He's before his fall, he was called Lucifer, which is light bearer. Uh, he was the shining one of God before this. And it says he's cast out to the earth. Okay, so it starts out that he rebels and he's cast out of heaven. Ultimately, he's cast to the earth. The reason he's cast to the earth and restricted here, and you can read in the book of Job, Satan says, I've come from the earth, from walking to and fro and up and down in it. And so here on the earth, Satan found uh, creatures, intelligent creatures made in God's image, a world where they were willing to listen to him instead of God. Whoever you obey, Romans chapter 6, that's whose servant you are. And when Adam and Eve decided to listen to the devil, when God said, do not eat the fruit, the devil said, go ahead, eat it. They listened to the devil. They basically surrendered dominion of this planet to the enemy. So he was cast out and restricted to this planet. And this world, with all its misery and suffering, is because it has been a beachhead for the devil's campaign against God. And the whole universe has seen in the unfallen angels what the result of Satan's government is. And all the misery and the suffering in this world is a result of that. Now we have a DVD called Cosmic Conflict that outlines this whole battle. I think the DVD is available on YouTube, actually. I yeah. think somebody's put it up there and it gets into this. You know, just two quick things I want to add to that, Pastor Doug. If you look in verse, um, in verse 9, it says, so the great, the great dragon was cast out. And then you look a little further, and verse 10 says, he was cast down to the earth. Mm -hmm. So there's two things. There's casting out and there's casting down. He's cast out of heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, that occurred before the creation of the earth. But after Adam and, er Adam and Eve uh, sinned, he claimed dominion of the earth. But in a special way, he was cast down at the cross when Jesus was victorious and overcame it was very evident that he had lost the battle. He's going around like a roaring lion, seeking yeah. whom he can devour. He knows he has a short time. So there's the casting out of heaven, then there's the casting down to the earth when Adam and Eve chose him above God. And then in a secondary sense, at the cross, Christ overcame him one more time. Yeah. So there's two, two words that's interesting to note. And Jesus said, uh, I saw Satan fall, fall like lightning. lightning from heaven. So, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it's no question he's been cast down. Yep. Great question, Hector. Thank you for your call. Um, next caller that we have is Jeannie listening in Kansas. Jeannie, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't know if you'd call it a question or a comment, but, uh, okay, Pastor Ross, I'm not trying to leave you out, but I'm going to ignore you because I want to talk to Pastor Ross. <laughs> That's <Doug>. fine. <laughs> <laughs> because he's a, uh, no, in, in, I don't know, maybe three or four of your programs, Pastor Doug, uh, you know, you commented, naturally people wonder about the Ark of the Covenant, and you've speculated, you know, that um, you think that they hid it in one of the many tombs around Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But I was just wondering, um, I know it doesn't say anything in the Bible about it, so I was just wondering if you had read early writings, page 32, about and yeah, about the law of that, God I'd being like exalted. To. Yeah, I, I, uh, we, you, you're talking about where the law of God is exalted. Uh, some are some people are wondering if um, the ark is going to be discovered. There's that verse in Revelation where it says, "I saw heaven open," and uh, the ark of the covenant is that Revelation 11. Revelation 11, yes, the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Yeah. Um, does that mean that the ark's going to be discovered? I think it's saying that the law of God is going to be exalted. I don't know what you think about that, Pastor Ross. Well, first let me back up before you answer that. Uh, so she's asking, why do you think it might be in a cave around Jerusalem? Well, the reason is the ark is still in the um, temple. It, the, the Ten Commandments are still in the ark, and the ark is still in the temple prior to the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. That's recorded. Uh, and it says nothing was in the ark but the tables of stone, the, something that happened to the pint of manna and Aaron's rod. Um, and it never appears as one of the articles that is carried off by Nebuchadnezzar. And it never appears when Ezra brings back the articles. It's disappeared from history. The only thing that can happen is Jeremiah, who foretold the destruction of Jerusalem, he with some other priests, or he directed some priests, they hid it so that the Babylonians would not get their hands on it when they conquered the city. 
and it's never been recorded since then. So, and you were going to say, now what does it mean there in uh, Revelation 11 when it talks about the ark? Yeah, here's the verse, Revelation 11, verse 19. It says, the temple of God is open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. It's the elevation of God's law. That's what's so important about the ark of the covenant. Um, and, of course, the great original of the law is in heaven, in right. the heavenly sanctuary. And the copy that Moses had made, or God wrote, and Moses put in the golden box and is hidden somewhere near Jerusalem. You know, Pastor Doug, I hope, you know, we don't, I don't know for sure, but I sure hope they do find that before Jesus comes. Oh that yeah, would be, that'd be great. the greatest archaeological find. Could that you or imagine? Noah's Ark, either Ark would be great. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yeah, but, but the Ten Commandments, yeah, Ten Commandments open the, and look inside and see, you know, where God wrote with his own hand. Of course, movies have been made about that, but to actually uh, see the golden box would be a, a glorious thing. It's quite possible it's there. We know it's there. Yeah. It's it's hidden somewhere, and, and maybe it will be found. Some even yeah. claim they have found it, but you yeah, know, there's all kinds kind of, of stories evidence. out there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yes, great question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Jeannie. Jeannie. The next caller that we have is uh, Mary, listening in Oregon. Mary, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for taking my call, and thank you so much for all the work you do for Jesus. Thank you. Um, my question is... Um, about idolatry um on um my friend was telling me that that having a picture of jesus in the sanctuary is is, is idolatry mm-hmm. and she directed me to isaiah 44 um 9 to 19 and it does say uh idolatry is foolishness right. so i was wondering uh what what is it on what is it really saying? Okay. Um, it's, it's really having a picture of Jesus. I, is it idolatry? Well, it could be. Uh, whether it's a picture, which is one-dimensional, or a statue, which is three-dimensional, you can worship either. Now, folks might be shocked uh-huh. to hear me say the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment, does not forbid the making of a facsimile or an image, a likeness. It says mm-hmm. you shall not make a likeness and bow down to it. Uh, an example of that right. would be when the children of Israel were bitten by snakes in the book of Numbers, Moses was instructed to make a bronze serpent. Well, that would be an image. But years later, when the people were praying to it, Hezekiah ground it to powder. Uh, God told uh, Solomon and, and Moses in the temple, they had angels on the ark. Well, you could say that angel's an idol. Well, it's just it was to represent the angels of God in heaven. Nobody was praying to the angels. But if someone should start praying to a statue or a painting of an angels or a statue or a painting of Jesus or Mary, that becomes idolatry. Uh, there's one church, they, says that, they say you're not even supposed to have a photograph of your family on the coffee table or the wall because that's an idol. Well, hopefully nobody's praying to that. Uh, so um, idolatry is making an image and praying to it. When you read in the Bible, Solomon, filled with the Holy Spirit, built the temple in Jerusalem, there were 12 calves that held up the altar of water, the laver. And they called it the sea because it was such a big compartment. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Nobody prayed to them. So uh, having a likeness of something, whether it's a fig or a pomegranate or a, um, a calf as they had there, as long as they weren't praying to it, it wasn't technically wrong. So hopefully that helps. And Isaiah, of course, is just he's highlighting how foolish it is to make an idol and pray to it. We should not pray to or worship, you know, representations. If it's going to make somebody stumble, don't put a picture of Jesus in your house or a statue. That's right. All right. Well, thank you for your call, Mary. We're going to go to um, Jose in Tennessee. Jose, welcome to the program. Hey, how's it going, uh, Pastor Doug and Ross? Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, your program. It's really helped me during some very difficult times. Um, and yeah, my question is on First Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse 3 says, uh, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I know that, you know, in, in paradise and in, uh, in the garden that nothing was created to be eaten except for, you know, 
the uh, the fruits of the trees and and things like that. So I'm kind of confused on what Paul is talking about here. I also know sure. that the background is a little bit on you know Gnosticism and um, they were restricting people from eating certain things. So can you kind of clear that up for me? Yeah. Well, I I think that what Paul is specifically talking about here is in the early church, um, the Jewish Christians were telling the Gentile converts to Christianity they could not eat any of the meats, and they're talking about clean meats, that were sold in the Roman or Greek marketplaces because they used to always sacrifice them before an, uh, some idol or altar. It was just typical in the butcher shops. And they saw this has been sacrificed to a god. And Paul said, whatever you buy in the flea market, in the meat market, eat it. Don't ask any questions for conscience sake. He says the idol is nothing. Uh, but if it bothers your conscience, don't eat it. And he says that there will be some in the last days that will be departing from the faith, saying you cannot eat certain meats which are sanctified by the word of God. Now, the Bible says there are certain clean meats you can eat. There's some churches that say you can can't eat fish on certain days of the week. I think you know what I'm talking about. And so, um, you know, clearly, uh, the uh, ideal diet for man in the beginning, in heaven, and even in this life, is the diet that God gave Adam and Eve. We've got a lesson that talks about that called um, God's free God's health plan. Free health plan. Yes. And if you'd like that. to receive that, the number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide. It's called God's free health plan. And of course, we'll be happy to send it to anyone here in North America. If you're outside of North America, you can just go to the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org, and you'll be able to read the study guide there as well. Pastor Doug, I'm um, looking at the clock. We've got a special session following. We say goodbye to our satellite radios here in just a minute. But stay around, friends. We're going to take some of your internet questions that you have emailed to us. Uh, we call it our, our rapid fire Bible question section. So we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. Hello, friends. Welcome back to our special segment where we take your uh, internet questions, your email questions, and we try to answer as many as we can in the time that's allotted. If you'd like to email a Bible question to Bible Answers Live, it's just simply balquestions at amazingfacts.org. That's B-A-L questions at amazingfacts.org. All right, Pastor Doug, here's the first question that we have. Somebody is asking, how do I convince my family members that their dead loved ones cannot talk to them? And then as part two of that question, are psychics bad? Okay, that, that's, they're both sort of related to the subject of death. Uh, you know, if you look in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, here and, oh, you can go to verse 5, it says, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. That means in this life. When people die, they never come back. The Bible does, never says anything about living who die and come back to haunt. Mm -hmm. uh, Job says, I think it's chapter 14, man dies, his sons come to honor, and he does, does not know it. Uh, Psalm 146, put not your trust in princes or in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth, he returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. They're not thinking anything. You need a brain to think, and the brain decomposes, you don't think. And so until you get your glorified body, you're not haunting anybody, and that's at the resurrection, the second coming. So no, and psychics, if people are consulting with the dead, uh, the Bible tells us very clearly, New and Old Testament, among the people in the lake of fire are the spiritualists. And Moses is pretty clear, have nothing to do with a medium that's communicating with the dead. It's uh, usually satanic. All right, here is a question that uh, we're hearing a lot about in the news today. And the question simply is, is the Bible pro-life or pro-choice? Well, Though, you know, people like the slogans, of course you would think God wants people to have life, and of course you would think God wants people to have choice. So let's set aside the, the, the labels that are used to define these two categories. The real question is, when does life begin and is human life sacred? Uh, the only place that you can say when life begins, human life, is at conception. That's why they call it conception. And in the Bible, when 
um, the Holy Spirit came on Mary. She conceived. And it says that Holy One that is within you. So human life begins at conception. It is sacred and should be treated and protected as such. Now we're really out of time. <laughs> God bless, friends. Till next week. Bible Answers Live. Honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions.